Hey, it's Katie and Liv. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our next episode and our second solo episode. Is it still a solo episode if there's two of us? We are one. So yes, (laughs) we are one. Okay. So, so welcome back. We're the founders of Inner Glow Circle and this podcast, of course, and we're really excited to be on here today. I actually feel like this might be one of our edgiest episodes yet. Ooh, edgy. Edgy. So one thing that's been bothering me a lot lately that I told Liv, I want to get right in there (laughs) and rant about a little bit is the showiness of the coaching industry. And I asked Liv if we could talk about it on the podcast. She obviously said yes, because we're here. And I think we should start by talking about the history of coaching as an industry, touching on IGC and why we got into this whole game. So Liv, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of coaching? It started in 2015 with Inner Glow Circle. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it actually took us a little bit of research to really get into this. I mean, I think we both have our own kind of origin stories of like our first access, but really the coaching industry um, as a profession or life coaching has only been around since the 1980s and is really an extension of sports coaching. I think often people still say, like if I introduce myself as a coach and I don't add that life coach in front of it, they're like, oh, what sport do you coach? I'm like, no, like I can barely walk without falling. Absolutely not. But (laughs) they do kind of go hand in hand. And I mean, you know a little bit more about this like invention of life coaching story, Katie, as the pro athlete that you (laughs) aspire to be. (laughs) Funny. Okay. So we did some extra research and there is a little bit of a debate about who invented life coaching. And obviously Liv and I've been in the coaching industry for almost 10 years now. So there's a lot of stories that I've heard over the years about where coaching came from and in preparation for this episode, because I wanted to bring you guys the most accurate information. I did some more research again and like I said, there's some debate, but the story is that, as Liv said, coaching really evolved out of sports coaching. And I love this part, especially because I am a tennis player. I'm not a pro tennis player, but I am a play- tennis player. I played in high school on the co-ed team. Um, but some people actually credit this guy, Tim Galway, as the founder of the coaching movement when he wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. It was published in 1974. And at the time, it was apparently like a revelation. This idea that in Galway's words, every game is composed of two parts, an outer game and an inner game. The outer game, he said, you play against your opponents, right? Like that's like the physical game. And then the inner game is played within your own mind. And so he felt that the biggest obstacles were self-doubt and anxiety. And this was something that he saw in, you know, his, in his tennis players. So it kind of started to catch on and become more mainstream. Yeah. And oddly you say like the inner game and the outer game and like, not to go into an IGC history lesson, but it's like the physical and the mental, right. And like IGC even starting as like the outer glow, right. Like as a spray tanning and then moving into like, it wasn't about just the physical, right? It's about the inner world and what's going on in your mind and really being able to build that mental resiliency. And so, you know, from there, my understanding is that it really caught on for like individuals and businesses, especially because whether you're, you know, working with your coworkers or you're in a boardroom or an office, you have to, of course, be doing the work, but you also have to have the you know, mental stamina and the be with and the confidence, right? I guess that would be the opposite of self-doubt and anxiety, but like the confidence and the motivation um, to be able to fulfill on the task. Right. Yeah. It's funny. I didn't even like put that together, the inner and outer glow, but like, as you started saying it, I was like, oh, I know where she's going with this. (laughs) It is so true because that was like the revelation that I had back in let's see, I started my spray tanning business in 2012 and then got into coaching at the end of 2012, early 
2013. So, you know, I have very, very quick history, but I had started a spray tanning business and had all these naked women coming in and out of my little studio. And I started to realize that like, they just wanted to talk and they were sharing so much with me and getting so intimate so quickly. And I was like, oh my God, they're coming for this like quote unquote outer glow as Liv said, but they're really coming for like this inner glow and this like internal transformation. They would share with me like the parts of their lives that weren't working. And it was so interesting because like spray tanning was this thing that made them feel beautiful. And, you know, even if it only lasts like what, 10 days to two weeks, depending on like how you take care of it, it really gave them this boost. And that was how I started coaching because I started like talking women through what they were actually going through aside from needing a spray tan because they were going on right. vacation or meeting up with an ex-boyfriend or whatever the detail was. So, you know, <laughs> it's very interesting. And then like Liv said, there was just so many parallels to the business world with the sports world and whatever you're doing, like you're kind of playing a game and you're trying to win, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, or you're trying to keep going. Right. And so that was where a lot of these parallels started to come from. And I think it's so funny because anytime I play tennis, I always am just like, God, there's so many connections to life. I don't know if you feel that when you're working out, I feel it when I'm just like running too, but like anytime I'm doing any kind of yeah. workout where I like have a lot of resistance or like it takes a lot of stamina and I want to give up. I'm like, Oh my God, this is how I feel in life. I feel like there's so many parallels. Yeah. Definitely with running. I do feel like yoga is a little bit different where it's like, you're just kind of allowed to flow and be there. But I think it, especially in like, here's what it's like a muscle, right? Like mm -hmm. your body it, physically, you can grow your muscles, right. And you can get stronger and you can get better. And it's also the case with your mind, but like one can't really work without the other, especially in sports, right? Like you need both. And I think what we do in coaching is we work with, you know, people on the, the, the mental, right. And often emotional at times and spiritual levels. Yeah. Um, and then the physical, I guess you would say comes in and actually taking action on their goals, right. Actually going out and, you know, doing the things that they say they're going to do, um, so I, just, I don't think one can really work without the other. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because like, you know, I feel like, especially in the past year, we've seen a lot of, um, athletes and like big performers take mental health breaks. And mm -hmm. it's like, if you don't have the mental game, you can't play. And sometimes like, I, I honor that, like, I'm not critiquing that I honor them taking a break, but it's like them knowing themselves, knowing that they need to work on their inner game in order to get back out there and play the outer game. You can't do one without the other to your point. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about our history and why we got into this business. We go through this a lot in our very, very first episode. So definitely go back and listen to that. It's like a quick episode, but it gets pretty deep into how Liv and I started our story, the story of IGC, what a lot of our fundamentals and values are, but we both got into coaching because we wanted to make a difference in the world. It was like this sort of innocent, you know, kind of idealistic. Like beautiful, <laughs> yeah. like idealistic, but like also like not that, like also kind of just like simple. Like, I, I don't think I was ever like, oh, I want to like do this huge, huge thing. I just wanted to like use my time in a way that contributed. I wanted to get paid well in a way that I could support myself. I didn't, you know, I, I it's not like I was trying to do anything like earth shattering or unattainable, not that mm -hmm. anything's unattainable, but like, I just wanted to help people and get paid and have that be a career. It was quite simple for me. What about you? Yeah. I mean, very similar. I don't even think I remember meeting you. I was like, Oh, people can get paid for to do like, it was kind of like the afterthought. I yeah. was just like, I want to be able to do something every day kind of on my own terms for sure. Mm -hmm. And also make a difference because as much as I felt like I was doing that in public education, there were so many restrictions and, um, you know, just didn't feel like the right thing eventually, you know? Um, so basically what we do, 
you know, together in an IGC is really help women to find their purpose and then live it, right? And ultimately get paid as much as they want to be able to make, right? To, to support mm-hmm. the lifestyle that they desire, which I know we're going to get into this a little bit, but like, I would say most of our students aren't like chasing down the handbag, but, you know, to be able to make an impact and have freedom and flexibility and all of that, um, better relationships, the healthier lifestyle, you know, being able to support their families and buy the things that they not only need, but also want, um, And ultimately it's just about, you know, breaking through the obstacles that are holding you back. Right. And that's ultimately Mm -hmm. that's coaching at its core. Yeah. And so like, we're definitely like in it, (laughs) I was like, we're definitely in it for the money. We're not, but like we are because you have to be right. Like you have to sustain yourself. You have to be able to live. And we're in it for our clients to make money. We talk about this in our first episode again, but a big, big part of IGC and how we created the business was we wanted to focus our students on getting an ROI. We're not succeeding unless our clients are succeeding. And that includes making back the money that they're investing. We don't want our clients leaving with like a ton of debt or like having to you know, get like, go through their 401k or whatever. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do crazy things to make things work, but we want this to be an investment that makes sense for people. And it's really, really possible because we both did it and our students do it all the time. And that's what we're showcasing all their stories on, on this podcast is like to make the money back along the way. But it's also not all about the money. And this is like my personal rant, but I'm just over some of these coaches and influencers and like there's those worlds kind of are meshed together a little bit now broadcasting their fancy lifestyles in this way that in my opinion can make other people feel like not good enough and I don't know. I'm just like so anti-bragging. I think it's very weird. People showing their bank accounts online. I don't know. I'm mixed because you know, I've heard people's arguments like, no, it's good for women to be triggered by seeing other women have a lot of stuff, whether that stuff is, you know, material or otherwise, because then it causes you to examine what inside of you is resistant to having these things. I mean, really it's like luxury items, but to me, that's just not, and not that I don't love that stuff. You know, I love that stuff, but to me, it's just so far from like why we got into this and why we started. And then there's like people showing like, you know, when people take like screenshots of their like PayPal transactions coming in or do you know when people do that? Yeah. Like coaches, that's like a trend now. I don't know. Like, I think it's weird. What do you think? Thank you for that personal rant. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, I think that what people you don't have do, to agree with me. What if people want to do with fine. their money is none of my business, right? You told me this a long time ago. I think we were talking about dating at the time. When are we not making those uh, connections. connections? But <laughs> you know, you can tell a lot about a person by their bank account, right? Like, what are they investing in? What are they spending their money on? Where is it going? And, you know, I, I still keep that in the back of my mind. I'm like, where's my name as a line item? But I think it, like, it, to me, I don't care. But I think when it comes to the coaching industry, getting kind of a bad rap, if you will, and like, this is like a red flag for me is if you're following a coach, whether they're doing business coaching or marketing coaching or relationships or confidence or whatever, and their main content or, or marketing copy is about how much money they have personally made. It's just weird to me. It's just weird. Like I've always been in the camp that client success is more indicative of successful coaching than the coach's income statement or bank statement or PayPal transaction log or whatever bag they're holding. Um, and who knows who even bought that? Like Anyway, or if it's rented, it's a it's whole like, other thing. It could be rented. Right, like it could, could be a gift yeah. from someone else. Like, and good, like take all the abundance that the universe or God offers you. I'm, I'm here for it. Like send me a Gucci bag or whatever. I don't care, but I mean, I do care, but you know, we, uh, we, I think just have always 
leaned more on the side of like, if you want to be a great coach, you are excellent at coaching, right? And so to me, coaching at its core is all about the client. So if all of my like marketing and photos and content is about how much money I'm personally making and spending um, and where I'm going and, and, you know, what designer stuff I'm wearing, it's like, what does that even have to do with the work that you're doing? Yeah. It, it just feels disconnected. I feel this like almost secondhand embarrassment, to be honest, like of the coaching industry, when I see some of this stuff out there, like I've seen coaches who specialize in like personal confidence and like women's empowerment. And every post is like, I made $150,000 this month. And I, if I was a client, I would be like, I like paid you that for you to then talk about it. And it feels very disconnected. I don't like it. It's never been my style to brag. I mean, I, but I was like, that's how I grew up, you know? And we were taught to be like very modest. Quiet, I remember yeah. my mom or grandma, like taking me shopping at Bloomingdale's and making me cut the price tags off my clothes before my friends came over so that they wouldn't know how expensive my jeans were because my mom was like, you got really way too expensive jeans. You're like overly spoiled. And I don't want you to become a brat. And like, we need to like tone this down. And so that was always what I was taught. And honestly, like, I, okay. So I've been in the coaching industry this, the end of this year will be 10 years. And you know, I see people coming into the industry, like really freshly, maybe they've kind of been playing around in this space for, you know, a year, just like following people, or maybe they've taken another training, or maybe they're trying to get their business going, or maybe they've gone through our program or wherever, but like someone who I would say is like a little newer, right. than a decade. And I just like, the space has gotten so much bigger, which is so great and so much growth. And I don't believe in oversaturation because like, why would people still be going to law school if there were too many lawyers or medical school or whatever? Right. And like, there's a million lawyers, there's very few great lawyers. There's a million doctors. There's very few great doctors. Like you can really stand out as a coach just by being a really great coach and being really great at what you do and getting referrals. And, you know, we talk about this a lot in our podcast and in our trainings, how to get more referrals and build your business that way. But anyways, all of this to say like 10 years in, I'll find myself scrolling and, you know, on Instagram, which I try not to do, but I find myself doing it and I I'll get triggered, but like, I'll be like, Oh my God, like, should I, should I be doing that? Should we be doing that? Should we be, be, you know, showcasing our numbers? There was a period where we went through when like that became really popular, where we were talking about how much money we were making as a company. And I remember being like, I feel so weird about this. It was so and- awkward. Well, I mean, <laughs> like we were just trying to do what everyone else was doing, I think. And like what was kind of trending in the industry, but I think I know where where we're like going inside of this conversation, I think, but it's like, it all goes back to your values. Right. And right. And if they're not aligned, then like you're borrowing someone else's value system and you actually can't do that. It won't work. It's like trying to wear someone else's clothes when they're just like, not your style. And yeah. Let me say one other thing too, because I was in another um, interview a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about not feeling like they fit in, in the coaching industry because Mm -hmm. they weren't, you know, mid twenties, early thirties, they weren't, um, into designer bags or living in Bali. And like, they felt really almost unwelcome, which I'm sure was somewhat internal. Right. And like, Mm -hmm. you know, we know as coaches that we often have Mm -hmm. to work on that being based piece, but it is, it felt like, very clicky, right? Like if you weren't Mm -hmm. going to this event or working with this coach or, Mm -hmm. you know, in front of the Eiffel tower with your Chanel bag, it was like, that was like the, the glossy life coaching industry. And I just think that, okay, it was cool, but it was never, it never really worked for us. And I remember that's when we were like, you know, we're more gritty, right? We're more. I have to add something here. Like I I love designer bags. I have a few bags like that are way probably overpriced. You know, I love purses. I really do. I love designer shoes. I've been to Bali. Okay. Like, I just want to say like, if you love those things or you've done those things, 
that's not what we're talking about. It's not having things. It's not having a nice car. It's not having a nice house, right? Like you have a very nice house. You have a very nice car, Olivia. Like it's not having those things that bothers me. It's making it such a big part of your marketing and your identity in a way that to me feels showy. Like I just, I'm very mixed about that. And I just want to say my belief is not that you should or shouldn't do it, but that like, that's not why we got into the game. We didn't get into the game so that we could buy more things and show people the things that we bought. We got into the game because we wanted to change people's lives and like feel more meaning in our days. Like I was so depressed and so frustrated and felt so like deflated. I remember like leaving New York after having multiple jobs there and just feeling like I don't fit anywhere and moving home, working for the family business and then hiring a coach because I was starting my spray tanning business, which was called Whole Glow and hiring a coach was what made me realize like, oh my God, you can get paid to talk to people. I don't have to become a therapist and deal with insurance and that whole nightmare. Like I can have a brand, I can do fun photo shoots. Like I can enjoy this and have it be creative. And it, that's what it was for me. It was creative and it was artistic and it was an outlet and it was, and it was a way to live in this world and get paid and have a career and do work that I loved and that felt extremely freeing for me. But then when you throw in this pressure of, well, then you have to have this thing and you have to post about having this thing. And when you buy a new thing, like it's weird. Cause like sometimes I'll buy something and I'll be like, should I show this? And I'm like, ew, no, so weird. Do you know what Dude, I'm saying? I just keep, I think about this. Like, can you imagine like a lawyer or a doctor like posing next to a designer bag to sell law or, or medicine. <laughs> it's so weird. Like I, I get right. to show success. Like we want to hire people that are a little bit further along than us or who have something that, you know, we want, who have some type of experience or have helped people create, you know, X, Y, Z for themselves. But it's like, I just, you have to make it tie in. You have to make it make sense. And I don't see a lot of that when it comes to showy displays. And I think we even kind of started this podcast, like almost making fun of the phrase six figure coach, because it's like just such a thing that's like out in the coaching industry. Right. And everybody just wants to make six figures. And it's like, I saw Sorry, but like earlier. six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, like now people I'm are just like for eight this, this year. five hundred figure, <laughs> five hundred right. figure coach. This thing earlier Look. I saw it said you're driving like success is not driving a brand new Mercedes Benz to a job that you hate. And I'm like, to me, I get that right. Like I'd rather love what I do every day. Um, like that's more important. Like helping people is more important to me than that kind of thing. So right. I wouldn't show that as part of my, brain. but it, it's like, you know, I think you and I are also just trying to unravel this whole thing ourselves live yeah. on the pod. <laughs> live brainstorming this. Rant. Right. And just like trying to figure it out, but also, um, oh my God, now I forgot what I was going to say. We're going to have to edit this. Okay. I mean, there's plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Okay. So also though, like you had a six figure business before you even came on board with IGC. Yeah. Because I was great at what I do. <laughs> right. And I had a six figure business before IGC. And then we've come together and built a multi six figure seven, et cetera, like business. Right. I don't want to like go into all of that. Cause we're like, we're, we're debating whether or not we even, how we even feel about that. But my point is we've had a lot of success and also we don't want to be defined by our things or our numbers. I think we want to be defined by our impact. And yeah. maybe that's where it feels like there's a discrepancy. And also when you started talking about the lawyer thing, you're like a lawyer would never pose with like a designer bag. Okay. So I'm even thinking about like, like why 
why is that what people show in the coaching industry? And I know that visually, cause we talk about this when we do photo shoots and I've always been more of our creative director, although you've gotten quite skilled in the creative department lately. Um, Liz even started styling herself. <laughs> <laughs> this beautiful t-shirt on from the IGC store. No, yeah. but I used to have to like really pick out all of our clothes and you did such a great job on the last photo shoot, but, um, <laughs> but you know, the thing about coaching is like, I think, let's say you have a coaching business and you want to show something through your brand, right? Like how do you show what coaching does? It's a lifestyle elevator. Like it elevates your lifestyle. And I think if all we can do is show our Chanel bags to show, to visually show how to shift your lifestyle or show our cars or show our, then we've gotten a little lazy. There have to be better ways that we can show our impact and we can show how we're elevating and show how we're evolving. And we've got to find more ways to do that than just showing the shit that we bought at Saks. Yeah. So to summarize this red flag of the coaching industry, I think that when you are looking to hire a coach, right. Or work with someone, just make sure there's some substance there, right? Like understand and try to get a feel for not just what they've created for themselves, but how they can actually help you. And I think that's often where the, the things get lost in translation. You can pose with your bag, but like, what does the content say? right? Like what is the, is it all about you and how much money you've made? Or is it all about how you can help people do that? Yeah. And, and like success stories of like what your clients are doing in their lives, Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So I want to just get back to the bare bones here and share our five core values in IGC. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Work for yourself, not by yourself create the thing you wish existed, say the thing no one else is willing to say, got to really be bold, change Mm -hmm. lives that change other lives, ding, ding, ding. And then find your glow, which we define as your greatest level of want. It's an acronym, G-L-O-W, greatest level of want. None of those say like you have to show off your stuff. That's fine, but it's not the mission. It's not why we got into this personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah not our mission, not our mission. And you do, you have influence, right? Like there's this whole influencer culture, whether you're a coach or an entrepreneur, like if you have clients, if you're sharing content out in the world, you have influence. So by nature of that, you are an influencer, you are a leader, be aware of what messages you're sending to people And I think particularly if like you work with women, what messages you're sending women about what they need to have in order to be happy or be successful and just check yourself a little bit and check the people you follow too. If you're following people that you are feeling icked by, unfollow them. I did that this morning. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if you have any type of influence as a coach, it should be positive and forward movement moving, you know, and And that's that. That's that. That's that. So Liv, the other thing we want to talk about today was some warning signs when it comes to hiring a coach or finding a coach training company. And part of our goal with this podcast overall is to help you become a more conscious consumer. There's a lot of noise out there. So we want to help you break through it. Totally. And uh, we've had a lot of, we've heard a lot of stories about people kind of shopping, you know, for coach training or for coaching And there are some red flags and we've heard some, you know, very emotional stories about people, you know, working with individuals that had no credentials or training or certification and, you know, not to make it too intense, but some traumatic experiences with, you know, the way that they've been spoken to and guided or or misguided, I should say, by people in the industry. So here's like one common phrase that we consider a warning sign or a red flag, uh, is if you're following someone who really downplays what you're going through or saying things like your suffering isn't real, 
just choose love and light, like kind of, you know, the Mm -hmm. light washing or whitewashing kind of statement. Um, that is not coaching, right? I think people would also maybe call it spiritual bypassing, Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not acknowledging someone's life circumstances and, you know, things that have happened to them. Um, of course, age, ability, race, ethnicity, any of that stuff can also play a role in that people Mm -hmm. who, you know, blatantly disregard that and just try to wash it over with positive mindset, major red flag. Yeah. You have to honor and validate your own lived experiences and the experiences of your clients. And so you want to make sure you're working with a coach or working with a program that does that for you. Cause if they don't do it for you, they're not going to teach you how to do it. And it's actually like, hopefully it's a natural thing, but it's also a skill of learning how to have empathy and be with people who have cultural differences and have had different lives, which is literally everyone. You know, we can't assume that because someone looks like us, we've had similar lives or because they don't look like us, we've had super different lives. Like we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I always say this anytime I'm, I like come guest teach and coach training, but I'm always like, you have to ask people, like you have to ask them, how did that feel for you? What was that experience like for you? And so, you know, what Liv is talking about is like coaches or programs that like jump over circumstances to the point where it feels harmful, right? Like coaching does teach you not to dwell on your circumstances forever. Like you are not your circumstances. You can rise above them. You can use them for good. You can spin them into gold, right? But they exist. And we're not just going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Enough about that. Like, it doesn't matter that your parents got divorced, like whatever it is that has impacted you. Um, well, you and the key to who- coaching, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I'm sorry. No, you just want someone who like listens. Go ahead. You want someone in like, who is getting curious, not passing judgment or disregarding and coaching in and of itself is, you know, asking these questions, getting curious, and then putting your client at choice. Wow. I hear you, you went through this and I know you've, you know, been handling it and it's still having an impact on you. What do you want to do with what you've been through? Right. And sometimes our clients will say, I want to write a book, right. Or I want to, you know, help other people go through that, speak, Mm -hmm. share. And other people will say, you know what, I'm actually kind of complete with this right now. I want to take steps in a different direction in my life. Right. But we don't ignore it. We don't force it. We just get curious we ask questions and then we help them decide what to do with what they've gone through. I remember when my brother died, like there were certain coaches that I had worked with previously when he, you know, when he was alive, that like after he died, there just was this huge rift between us because I felt like they really just couldn't be with the level of pain. And like, they just kind of tried to like scoop past it. And, you know, that's the other thing, like someone can only take you as deep as they can go. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who has a lot of depth and breadth and wants to have deep conversations, both for yourself and with your clients, you need someone who can do that with you. And if you share intimate details of your life or basic details of your life, and someone's like, Oh, okay. Well, anyways, like just, that is a real thing. You're not just feeling it. It's real. And you need to pay attention to that. I think the bigger breakthroughs happen when people go there, you know, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So there's some more, what's another one Liv? Oh, here's another one, which I think is, we're going to break it down a little bit too, but it's the whole notion of like, if you wanted it badly enough, right. When it comes to making an investment, you would find a way to make it work. I have seen people, um, you know, having, their prospective clients, you know, go into major debt with no plan to pay it off, put things on multiple credit cards, completely max themselves out, um, sell, you know, family heirlooms, sell their home. Like, and sometimes, you know, if that's the most powerful decision for you, like I'm one who is broke, broke, broke financially when I got into coaching. Okay. I put Uh a few hundred dollars on a credit card that had, I, I think the limit was like $600 max that baby out. And then I got this like small business loan, right. Yeah. With a horrible interest rate. Yeah. But it was like, I just was so sure. Like I just was so sure. And I didn't feel scared of that decision. I felt like 
this is the only way for me to actually make this happen. So I'm not saying maxing out your credit card to, you know, hire a coach or to take on your business endeavors or coach certification is a bad decision, but you know, when it's a bad decision, you know, when it's not your decision. So like Mm -hmm. if a coach is telling you to do it, first of all, that's not coaching, right? (laughs) Coaching one-on-one, we're not telling people what to do. I will say that like in a lot of sales conversations or enrollment conversations I've been in, if somebody says, I really, really want to do this, but I don't have the money. I will say, do you want to talk about different ways to get the money? Do you want to talk about options? I'm not going to say like, you need to fill out this loan application right now and accept a loan that's outside of your means and makes you uncomfortable. Right. So you have to be, you know, cautious of what you're you know, who's in charge, right? Because at the end of the day, coaching should be a client driven process and it should make you feel confident, not uh, stuck or, or swayed by someone else's decision for you. Right. So like lives an example of someone who like found a way to invest in coaching when she didn't really quote, have the money and she did it through a credit card and she did it through a loan with a self-admittedly terrible interest rate. Right. Mm -hmm. Those were her ideas though. Like that was how she was like, okay, how can I figure this out? How can I do this? And like, like she said, she was so sure you were so sure. Like, I just love hearing you say that. Like you had so much confidence, like it didn't matter, you know, Mm -hmm. and you were going to figure it out, but they were your ideas. No one was like convincing you or manipulating you into doing it. So, you know, you First of all, like I, my belief is if you have a plan, if you're making a big move, like you, like you did, you're not putting yourself in a bad financial situation. If you have a plan that's realistic, right? Right. If you're putting yourself in a position that you don't have a plan around and you're like, just doing it because I don't know, you feel like you should, someone told you to, et cetera that might not be a good choice for you. And you do not need to put yourself in a bad financial situation to work with a coach or go through a coach training certification. For us, this is why we have such a big focus on ROI, return on investment in our certification program, as I keep saying, because most of our clients, some pay in full, but most of our clients do want to pay as they go through the program. So that's why we've, we offer these really long term payment plans, sometimes even like 18 months on a six month course, because, you know, some people like, that's the only way for it to happen for them that is not going to also put their nervous system into an overdrive where they're panicked because they have to figure stuff out so fast. Like there are so many ways to do this and get into coaching, get into a certification program that do not require such extreme scenarios. Exactly. And I think going back to the, having a plan is everything. Cause I remember looking at that loan and the interest rate and saying, I'm committing like my life at this point to this business that I'm starting. Right. And when I did the math on what the loan would cost to pay back, I think the interest rate was like 28 or 29%, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I did the math and I was like, okay, do I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I, I, I will, for the sake of this, I'll say, do I think I'm going to make more than $20,000 in my business? And I was like, the hell yeah, I, I do. It like, was like a $20,000 loan. It was a $12,000 loan. I just don't know the math on what oh. the, like if I had not been able to pay it off early, which I did do. So saved myself thousands in interest. But like, I remember thinking to myself with the plan that I had created and just like that inner knowing there was no way I wasn't going to make more than that. And I think my first full year in business, I hit six figures and I wasn't, you know, doing anything different than what we teach our students to do, you know? Right. Which is why we teach it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Okay. So another red flag is if someone tells you I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. We touched on this before, but coaching is not consulting. It's not telling someone what to do. It's not giving advice. It's not the exact steps that you need to get 10,000 followers or hundred thousand followers or get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or both or create your dream life or have my life. Like, right. That way that's all consulting and advising, which can be valuable but it's really important because it's very, very different. And it's 100% not coaching. Right. Coaching is not giving people advice. 
No. And I think that just like we say, like oftentimes therapy and coaching go beautifully together. Oftentimes, you know, mentoring or consulting and coaching go beautifully together. We have so many women who go through coach training that also want to be teaching some type of concept along with coaching, right? So there's like, you have a group program where there's something is taught and then you coach around the topic. Like they can go really well together. But if you're truly looking to hire a coach, like Katie said, if they're telling you like, here's my blueprint to success, here's the five steps you're going to take to do X, Y, Z, it, it's not really coaching. So, and I just but, don't think it's a long-term solution. No, but one distinction here and like sort of an exception is coach but, training, right? So like there's a different, we're talking about coaching, hiring a coach, like a private coach. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And that is not consulting in coach training. It's a course we run a coaching school. So we do take you through a specific process. Exactly. And you are coached throughout it, but the, the foundation of training is teaching, right? So we are telling you how to be the best coach, right? of nuance in this. I know. And so, but Liv, like each talk about this a little bit, like every week of class builds upon the previous week. And there is a system that we teach yeah. in coach training. Yeah. And there's a reason why we do that. Why do we do that? Well, we, why are our lessons co- the way that they are? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like why in an education program? Oh, from an education. I mean, yeah. like we're trying to take people from point A to point B. So the right. curriculum is really built upon like, what skills do you need to know first? Right. So lesson one is literally like, what is coaching? Right. Um, you know, what are the core competencies or things that you must learn to be a great coach? Right. And then in two, what are the differences in all these modalities, right? Spiritual mentorship, therapy, coaching, consulting, teaching, you know, how are they defined? How are, you know, how is each thing different? Right. Because one of the things that our students come to us often, whether they've been quote unquote coaching on the side or not is I don't know how to tell people what I do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so really being able to have a true understanding of what you do and how you take people from point A to point B is crucial. And so we have our lessons very much scaffolded on, you know, the knowledge builds upon itself each week. Right. So that you're able to really grow your skills and the call, the way the training calls are structured are similar to what I just said, right? Like most of it is teaching. There's a lot of, um, you know, hands-on learning in the classroom, right. Where people are asking questions mm-hmm. and getting support from other students. And then there's also a coaching aspect, right? Like where your, you, our students are able to say like, here's what I'm going through, you know, as a new coach or in my coaching business, and they're able to be coached. And you'll hear in the classroom too, like, I'm going to put my coach hat on for a second. And then their teachers will say like, I'm not coaching you right now. I'm training you. And we make that distinction so that it's really clear and you can really, you know, see what it is, but you don't want to, you know, you want to be careful of people who, you know, are just going to tell you exactly what to do step-by-step because Although you can Google how to do anything step by step. That's what I always say. You don't need a coach. You go to Google. Google has almost anything, right? I, I cooked more food the last two years of my life than I have ever have in my entire life before that because I Google a recipe, right? Step by step by step by step. Who has to motivate me to actually take the steps? Me, right? So like if you're mm-hmm. trying to lose weight or get healthier relationships or get a new job or improve your resume or whatever it is, you can Google how to do that. The coach comes right, in, but that's make, not what coaching is. That goes back right. to like the inner and outer game. That's like, that's the outer, that's game. the doing versus the being. That's, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the coach is really there to, you know, help you define what it is that you're looking for and, you know, move out of the way, any obstacles that are stopping you, right. Like whether it's <laughs> procrastination, laziness, lack of resources, lack of support in your life, you know, move those obstacles out of the way so that you can actually take action. Yeah. Um, and of course the accountability aspect. So no one can fix your life really except you. (laughs) Right. And like your inner game, going back to the very beginning when we were talking about the tennis analogy and how coaching started as an industry, but like your inner game in no way can look exactly like someone else's inner game. Right. Mm -hmm. So if your outer game is, let's just say, I want to make a million dollars or I want to have a million dollar network net worth, let's just pick a random thing. Then that like that goal, that outer goal is the same outer goal as many other people probably. Right. Or maybe your outer goal is I want to get married, same outer goal. Okay. 
but your inner game and the goals you have to internally set to get there are going to look very different, right? Like, uh, let's say, I mean, that makes sense, right? Like, yeah, and we're going to have different your, barriers. All of like, your experiences, like my childhood was very different than yours. I'm going to run into different, you know, issues or obstacles that I have to get through to create a loving relationship, right? So right. you have to have somebody. And I think a lot of people are like, I'm going to hire a coach. And they'll be like, oh, I got so much out of this like discovery call. I'm going to go try to do it by myself. I mean, more power to you, but you've been trying to do it by yourself for so long, right? So the coach right. is and really it- the one who comes in you know, and hold your hand to a degree. And an excellent coach, a well-trained coach, an IGC certified coach, (laughs) like a really great coach, whether they went through our program or another program is going to help you become more of an expert on you. No one knows more about you than you, but often we need someone to hold our hand, like Liv said, to help us peel back the layers, to ask the hard questions and to help us really understand what's going. So what's going on. So we're not here to scare you. We're here to inspire you to do your research, to trust your gut, to trust your intuition, to become conscious consumers, to unfollow or walk away from people or situations that give you the heebie-jeebies. Like you really have to trust yourself. Like you are the expert on you and your life. And there's no one that knows what you need better than you. That being said, you know, the purpose of having a coach, having trainers, having a support network, having people on your side is to help you get closer to you. But in order to do that, you need someone who's really actually just going to hold up a mirror Mm -hmm. figuratively and say, you know, what do you actually want? If I was listening to this 10 years ago, Katie, I would be like, at that. Like, I want someone to just fix my life. Like I want someone to tell me exactly what to do, how to get myself out of this mess. Yeah. Because that was your thing that you were asking for direction. But I think that a lot of people would may have experienced this or felt that way, or may even even be listening to this now being like best consultant ever, right? Like looking for that. But I think at the end of the day, and what's really always drawn me back again and again to coaching and being coached and being in this world is that there is no greater expert than myself. And once you realize that and really feel it, it's going to ignite your confidence, right? And you don't want to have to be hiring someone, you know, to help you forever, right? And I think the nice thing about okay. coaching is they said like a great coach is going to inspire you to take ownership of your life beyond the coaching session, right? Like I'm not dependent on someone for my next step all the time. Okay, right, right. And also- like we're here talking about life coaching, life consulting. I'm sure we can Google it and find a few, but like, it doesn't really exist as an industry because no one can consult you on your life. It is your unique life. It is the most unique thing that you have. It is everything. Right. Right. So you can hire a marketing consultant to help you figure out a funnel to convert people better because they've done it a million times and they can advise you on it. But like life consulting is not really an industry because it's not really a thing. Exactly. And a coach will give you ideas and resources, right? But it's not from a place of like, you should do this. This is what you need to do next. It's like, I, I mean, the language is just different, right? Where you're still putting your client at choice. Hey, I have this great free workshop. I think you'd get a lot out of it. Or I read this great book that I think is touching on a lot of the conversation. Would you be open to taking that on as you know, an action step that have them choosing it. The more I did this in the confidence workshop that I did a couple months ago, it's like the more you start actually making decisions for yourself and for your life, that's what grows your confidence. Right. I completely agree. And let, let me just give this one example. So like, let's say like Liv and I are coaches, been coaches for a long time. So this is how we operate in the world. When you first start coaching, it feels like a language shift because most of us grew up people who grew up being people who gave a lot of advice. People came to us for advice. We're always giving mm-hmm. our friends advice. And then when you realize like advice is kind of a no-no in coaching, you have to, like Liv said, sort of just like tweak your language and get 
you know, get to uh, the core of something differently. So let's just say Liv comes to me or calls me in the middle of the day or whatever and says, what should I do about this dating situation? Why is it always dating with me? I don't know. (laughs) Just like, okay. Or I call you and say, what should I do about my crazy husband who's driving me insane? Like whatever the situation is. So instead of saying, here's what I think you should do, which like 10 years ago, one, I would only really know that that was how to answer that kind of question Mm -hmm. Two, I would sort of feel this like pressure to like have an answer and like show that I'm like good at giving advice. And, you know, I don't think there's a number three. So those are my two. So, but now the way I will handle that, whether live is live or live as a client or a student or whatever is say, well, what do you want to do? Like, that's like a, a, a very like broad coaching question, top of the funnel, where it's like, it starts, it starts a process of exploration and Liv's going to say, well, I, I don't know what I want to do. That's why I'm asking you. And I might say, okay, well, give me some of the things that you've thought through, right? Like, again, like I'm pulling stuff out of her because my belief as the coach is that she actually does have the answer. It might be fucking so deep inside of her that I got to like do surgery to get it out. But like, that's my job as the coach is like to sort of like play detective and get in there. So I ask her, well, what are some of the things that you've thought of? And she's like, well, I've thought of this and I've thought of this, I thought of this, I thought of this. And guess what my job is as coach? I just listen. I shut the F up and I listen. That was the other thing I really needed to learn as a coach because I was not the best listener. I liked to talk. So now I've learned how to listen. You tell. <laughs> I, so I was, li- you know, so I'm listening. And so Liv's like, well, you know, she maybe says, you know, well, gives me a couple scenarios. And I say, okay, let's go with scenario A. Let's pretend that you actually play that scenario A out. How might that go? So I'm not going to go through this whole like sample coaching session with you. We you should do an YouTube episode channel. on that though. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We, you can go to our YouTube channel and, and see some of our coaches coach, but like the point is that you can see how I'm not giving her advice. I'm not trying to like show off and say, I know what she should do with her life because I don't, not because I don't have a good life, but because her life is a different life than mine. And it doesn't matter if we have the exact same goals. Like that's the other mistake I made. I just got married a couple of months ago. Let's say a client came to me and they're like, I want to get married. Well, what it took for me to get married and for me and my husband to move forward and deepen our relationship is not the exact same. Some of those situations might be valuable. So I might share, you know, very um, specifically some situations of where we got help or conversations we had to have. And I might say, you know, I'm going to share this as an example. What do you see for yourself in what I just shared? Mm-hmm. not, I didn't share it because I want you to go do the exact same thing. Cause you're not trying to duplicate my life. You're trying to hack your own. And I might have a couple little nuggets that can help you get there. So anyways, yeah. you guys get it. Okay. Go be professional yeah. coaches out in the world. <laughs> um, I want to, I think the last one too, like we just have one more that I think is really important to cover probably quickly. Cause I feel like a lot of what we talked about already um, connects to this piece, but I mean, empty promises overall, but one of the ones that I can't stand the most, (laughs) do you want to do it, Katie? If, if you work with me, I can heal your trauma. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you know, look, your coach is not a therapist unless they are a therapist. Mm -hmm. And even so, right. Like you can go listen to Sam Sinnott's episode about that. What is that? Our, I think that's our fourth episode. Sam is a graduate of ours. She is a social worker and therapist and also a trained coach. She talks a lot about the distinctions between those two and her own experiences and then how it plays out with clients. But coaching is not a healing modality. It's not therapy. It can end up being very healing. People do leave their therapist to work with a coach. I've seen that happen myself. I know you've had it happen, Liv. Our our students have had that happen. That's not wrong. Sometimes it's the right next step for people because, Mm -hmm. you know, their coaching is more effective in where they are in the moment. But coaching in and of itself is about setting goals, building, creating, removing obstacles, and doing it through partnership and accountability. It's just 
different. Right. I mean, I tend to go like Louise Hay style, like you can heal your life. Like you are the only person who can take action to heal yourself. Um, I do think that like fundamentally, or I don't think I know, like as coaches, we cannot diagnose someone. So therefore, how would we be able to heal them? Right. Or treat them. Or it's treat them. Yeah. yeah. So it just isn't that. I think that that's a huge red flag for, but I've seen it a lot, especially with, you know, the trend, if you will, of like trauma informed coaching and all of that, just do your research, you know, make sure that if someone is saying there's healing powers or healing, whatever in their coaching, do they have some type of, are they a certified clinician or in the mental health field or a licensed psychologist or therapist or something? Um, we're not even going you know, backwards as coaches, right? We're going forward. So be a conscious consumer, creating, not healing, pay attention. Right. It's also like, I think questions. just the the whole nature of like coaching being this thing where it's like, you have to go, you go to coaching if something's wrong, like maybe sometimes like coaching is a creative process, right? Like I would get so frustrated when clients would be like, I don't have a coaching request because like everything's great. I'm like, great. This is the time to have a coaching request, request oh my God, right? It's one of my like this is when now we can actually work on that project, right? We can outline the goals. We can do this. Like coaching is not sure. Bring up what's going on, bring up the obstacles. But our goal in coaching is to create, to move through those things in order to create. So yeah. End rant and seen cut. And Katie, you've been talking about like conscious consumerism throughout. And I do think it's just important to touch on that before we wrap up. Like, what does that actually mean? Um, you know, for, for our listeners. Yeah. And it's really like as a consumer buying into a business, meaning spending your money with businesses that like lead with their moral compass that have shared values that don't do things that you're innately against, um, that are aware of their impact environmentally, socially, et cetera. And that don't give you the creeps, you know, if someone Mm -hmm. or something gives you a weird feeling, pay attention to that. Yeah. I mean, I think being a little bit nervous is a good feeling when you're making an investment in coaching, because you know, it's going to change your life. Like we talk about all the time. You know, even people enrolling in coach training, like, of course you're nervous. Like you're sure you're, you're making a financial investment, but you're also literally, you know, potentially leaving a job that you've been in changing your lifestyle altogether. Right. So just be, there's a different feeling like, I know it's so it's hard to explain. It's, it's so challenging. It's taken me so long and I still am not always sure, but to like figure out the difference between just like my fear versus an intuitive, like, no. Yeah. And I I don't know, for me, it comes with like, the only way to describe it for me is like, it feels a little dirty. Ooh. Like it feels like- Like if it's a bad now? Yeah. Like if it's, if it's a, if it's a stop sign. Yeah. It feels a little icky. It feels like a little dirty. It feels like the energy is sort of weird or sticky or- do you know what I mean? I a hundred percent know what you mean. Whereas like, if it's fear, I might like literally feel like I want to pee my pants or like, I want to throw up or like, I don't know if this is the right decision or like, I felt like that when I was getting married, like I was like so scared. And shout like, out Adam. <laughs> what? Shout, shout out, out Adam. Adam. <laughs> it's so funny. Cause like, I keep just keeping like, I keep saying this if I'm like, I'm so glad I married you. Like, I'm so glad I chose you, but like, we were getting married very quickly and I had been engaged before and now I'm like getting emotional, but like, I was really, really scared because I had so much trauma around a previous, like literally being engaged in wedding planning and my ex like completely losing it, which if you want, you can read my book and learn about that. But, you know, and so literally when I was like, um, I talked about this in the book, but, and you were there for this. So like, there was this whole crazy thing with like my ring when I was previously engaged. So when Adam and I went like looking at rings, I like would get like hot and like flushed all over. And I, my body was having a reaction and I was scared. I was like, does this mean I'm not supposed to marry Adam? Because I really wanted to marry Adam, but I was having this whole experience and 
you know, the way this, I see this connecting to the topic that we're talking about today is you may have had a previous experience with a coach or a therapist or any kind of practitioner who broke your trust, who you felt like, you know, they didn't listen or they gave you the wrong medication or they stepped over your circumstances in a way that you didn't like. You know, I remember one time a therapist kept saying that my brother committed suicide when like that Bo died from a drug overdose and, you know, we knew it was accidental. And like that, like, I was like, this woman is like not listening. Like, this is like not a small detail. Mm -hmm. And she kept talking about suicide. And, and I was like, it was a different kind of pain. And I wanted her to talk about the pain that I was having. And so I massively lost trust and I broke up with her as a therapist. Like, so, you know, and in, and then moving forward, it's been a challenge for me to find other therapists or other coaches or that I trusted because previously I've had my trust broken. And so maybe you barely trust the SEO people. God. So, you know, my point is like, you might've in the past worked with people, either individual practitioners or done programs or done like courses where you did not have a great experience or you didn't gain a lot from it, or you feel like you wasted your money. And when you go to invest again, of course, you're going to be nervous. You Mm -hmm. might be scared shitless. You might be having all these memories come up from before. And it's just important to spend some time untangling that and saying, okay, am I, do I want this? Number one, I always believe that the biggest sign is your desire. Number two, even though I've been hurt before, do I feel that I trust the people that I'm talking to now, you know, does it feel different, even though there's elements that they're similar, does it feel different? And then trusting yourself to me. Yeah. And, and also then like, kind of like womaning or manning up or whatever you want to call it and saying like, I'm taking responsibility for this choice that I'm making. I'm taking responsibility for this investment. I'm choosing to trust myself and this person to guide me and then owning it. Right. And that's like the, the moving through it that we also need to go. I mean, that's like for any relationship or hiring anyone, but I think you have to be, you have to own the choice. You have to take responsibility for your role inside of the relationship and also commit to, you know, showing up. Yeah. Fully. So there are really incredible coaches out there in the world. Olivia and I are two of them. Uh (laughs) Well, no, but a lot of our students really are some of them, I mean, all of our graduates are incredible coaches and great coaching really does work. Yeah. Um, but you do like anything like finding great lawyer, like finding great doctor, like finding great therapist in order to find a great coach, you have to, you know, do some interviews. Like I I interview, I interview doctors. I don't just like go to the first doctor that I, someone recommends. I like, I all, even at work, I always say, I'm like, we need to interview at least three people for the job Right. with everything. The coaching industry is still only mildly regulated, right? Like by the ICF and Mm -hmm. you know, you, anyone can put coach in front of their name, right? it doesn't mean Mm -hmm. they have any credentials or skills or you know, the experience that they need to actually be able to help you transform your life. And there's a growing, right. There's so many people claiming to know how to live their best life. And some people are, and, um, you know, you just really want to make sure that the coaches you're working with are certified, that they have experience, that they're professional and they know what they're doing ethical, you know, Chanel handbags in front of the Eiffel tower aside, like, are they actually equipped to take you on you know, that journey or through the coaching process. So, so in summary, be a conscious consumer, ask questions. Like, don't be afraid to ask, where did you do your coaching certification? Are you a credentialed coach? Um, and you know, even if someone's credentialed, like they might not be the right vibe for you. So that's where like, you might not be able to ask them questions. You have to feel and pay attention to how you're feeling. You can ask to speak with someone's previous clients um, the right coach is going to have the right resources, trainings, and certifications that 
connect to you and your needs as well. Yeah. And I think a coach who makes you feel inspired, right. And holds you accountable, helps you get into action is absolutely worth the time and money. Like Katie said a while ago, this isn't to scare anyone. It's just to help inform people and, you know, bring light to some of the side conversations I really see going on in the coaching industry. Um, and really, we just hope this helps you navigate the industry, gives you signs to look for. And of course, like Katie just went through steps to take um, to make sure you're getting the most out of your coaching experience, your investment of time, money, energy, and that whether you're looking to hire a coach or become a coach, you know exactly what to look for and you feel confident in making that move. Yeah, no industry is perfect. And because coaching is truly so young in the grand scheme of things as an industry, of course, it's like just working itself out. It's like, am I about, you know, am I about trauma? Am I about lifestyle? Am I about, you know, what is coaching really about? What is it here to do in the world? And because it's so young, like we actually, as leaders in the industry, meaning me live and you listening, get to continue to define that. We get to continue to raise the bar as far as what great coaching is, what ethical coaching is, how to operate as a coach, and what works and doesn't work inside of this industry. So go out there, make your impact on the world, create your six figure business or seven, eight million figure business, whatever you do, do you, we're right behind you cheering you on the whole way.